It's time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. A presentation of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company, maker of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longines. Good evening, this is Frank Knight. May I introduce our co-editors for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope. Larry Lasseur from the CBS television news staff and Francis W. Carpenter of the Associated Press. Our distinguished guest for this evening is the Honorable Richard G. Casey, Foreign Minister of Australia. Our guest tonight is generally regarded as one of the top diplomats of the Western world. He was the first minister to Washington and during World War II he was a member of the British War Cabinet under Churchill. And in recent years, he's conducted the foreign policy of Australia, the key power in the Pacific. Mr. Casey, you helped negotiate the recent Manila Pact. Uh, now, is that a scrap of paper, or uh, does it have any real and effective meaning? Well, Mr. Lusseur, every treaty starts by being a scrap of paper. But we hope and believe, in fact, we're convinced that the Manila Treaty has got to have life breathed into it in the next six months. Uh, we're quite certain that's going to happen and that it's going to be a most effective means of um, uh, restoring uh, some sort of reasonable uh, conditions in Southeast Asia. We believe it's the most valuable thing and we are extremely grateful, we people in Australia, for the initiative the United States has shown uh, in uh, starting all this business off. Well, Mr. Casey, uh, how is it the guns are booming now and the... Uh against Kimoi in the Straits of Formosa and uh, nothing seems to be happening. Well, actually that's outside the Manila Treaty area. The northern limit is just south of, um, uh, of that area. Doesn't come into it. Well, Mr. Casey, do you think that there will be any sort of a general war breaking out there in the Chinese area around Formosa? They seem to be making motions at uh, Formosa. Um, yes, uh, that is so. It, it looks rather menacing at the moment, but I can't believe myself that um, that either side there really wants a full-scale war, and that could quite easily come, come about uh, unless the communist Chinese in the first place show a great deal more restraint than they seem to be doing at the moment. Well, on the point of the communist Chinese, there, there is still a great campaign to try to get them admitted to the international councils and to the UN. What do you think uh, about that, about letting them in? Well, our situation, our attitude of mind in Australia is that it's too early yet. We cast our minds back quite simply to the last few years uh, and we see uh, Chinese communist aggression in Korea. Uh, then again, when that was finished, when that, brought, uh, that war was brought to an end, we had it in Indochina. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, barely has the war been stopped in Indochina, then you get this outbreak of, uh, of tension in, uh, in Komoi. Mm -hmm. So we don't think that uh, really uh, reflects uh, a peaceful intent. And after all, a peaceful intent is the first criterion for membership of the United Nations. Mr. Casey, is one thing, isn't it, to plan against outside aggression by the communists, but what about the more subtle means of uh, subversion? Yes, like, indeed. Like Czechoslovakia. Yeah, that, uh, indeed, that, uh, that is the real menace. Uh, outright aggression, well, you can cope with it or you can't, but you know what it is. But the more subtle thing that uh, the communists have uh, brought to a fine art is this business of internal subversion. It's very hard to cope with although we are going definitely to try to cope with it if it breaks out in Southeast Asia. We're going to try and do that by uh, trying to, uh, with the consent of the governments themselves there, try to, to, to strengthen those governments, uh, to strengthen their, their, uh, their, their armies and their police forces, to strengthen their economies, and to try and um, uh, improve the standard of living of their peoples. All those things build up into uh, a situation in which internal subversion at ten rates is very much more difficult. Mr. Casey, you'll be partaking in an important conference in Canada. Will that have anything to do with the uh, building up of Southeast Asia? I think so, yes. That is the, 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 the Colombo Plan conference that uh, we start in a few days' time. Uh, yes, the object of the Colombo Plan is to strengthen the economies, to, to, to improve the standard of living uh, of all the peoples of South and Southeast Asia. Uh, yeah. The people who are trying to do that are, of course, primarily yourselves, uh, the United States also Great Britain and Canada, New Zealand and ourselves. And the countries that uh, we hope are benefiting by the Colombo Plan are countries like India, Pakistan, Ceylon, uh, uh, Burma, uh, Indonesia, uh, the countries of Indochina and the Philippines, and of course Siam too. 
Well, that is the one plan that everybody seems to be able to agree on then in that area yeah. in, in uh, Asia. That is so. There's no controversy about the Colombo plan. It's uh, a means of canalizing in, as you might say, canalizing in economic and technical aid uh, to those countries that very much need it. Mm. Mr. Casey, your Australians had a pretty tough time during the war. How do your people feel now about the Japanese? Well, uh, I, I think that uh, the average Australian would say to you in answer to that, that um, once the war's finished, well, that's finished. You can't go uh, harboring uh, distrust and dislike forever. I think the sensible thing is to let bygones be bygones and try and uh, help Japan become a, a useful and cooperative member uh, of, the, of the world community. Uh, well, are you going to let them into your Colombo plan to build up Southeast Asia? Uh, well, that's coming up next week. I don't want to forecast the result of that, but I hope uh, for myself that Japan comes into the Colombo plan, yes. Well, Mr. Casey, the uh, relations between Australia and the United States have always been very good, but uh, from your recent uh, visit here and everything, what do you think this country can do uh, to uh, make things better with Australia? I mean, uh, what can we do to help out? Uh, well, as you rightly say, we've tried over the years, and I think successfully, with, with your great help, uh, to keep on the best possible relations with you. Very good. Uh, well. Uh, you ask what you could do. Well, uh, I suppose in a minor way, one would say that uh, as we're the, I think, uh, the biggest wool producers in the world, I wish you'd use more wool in this country. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Casey, of course, Australia is a member of the British Commonwealth, but it always seems to me that you're most firmly behind and supporting American policy. What would happen if you had to choose between the British Commonwealth and uh, the policies of the United States? Well, I'm strange you ask that, because I'm sometimes asked that in my own country. But um, I think the simple answer is that it will never be a matter of choosing. Uh, we believe, we people in Australia believe most strongly that uh, uh, for the future security and indeed the survival of the democratic world, you and we, that is the British peoples and the American peoples, have got to march along as close together as one blade of a pair of scissors to the other. Uh, and that goes for Australia and this country. Uh, it's never, uh, I hope and pray, going to be a matter of choosing. We're, uh, we're very loyal to our mother country, Great Britain, but that doesn't stop us being on the very best possible relations with you. Mr. Casey, uh, some of our people here are a little cross these days with uh, some fellow Dominions, like uh, particularly India. Now, do you think the rise of uh, neutralism in Asia, in the India, Indonesia, Burma, is that an asset or a, a loss to Western world? Well. It's not a policy, uh, uh, of course, as uh, I, I think you'll realize, it's not a policy that, uh, that we agree with. Uh, but those countries, you mentioned India and, um, uh, and Burma and Indonesia, uh, they are perfectly capable of making their minds up for themselves. Uh, it just so happens we don't agree with the policy. But uh, there it is. Uh, I, I don't think it's a policy that's going to disturb the world at all. Uh, for us in Australia, we've... Um, we believe that you can't be neutral in the world as it is today. We believe the issues are so great uh, and so all-embracing and so abnormally important as between communism and, and democracy that you've got to take sides. We happen to believe that. Uh, there are people, of course, who don't. But um, there it is. I'm not going to criticize their policy because they're good friends of Australia, each one of them. Uh, Mr. Case, I'd like to approach the question of politics from another angle. Uh, we hear an awful lot from uh, Australian men around uh, in the United States and, and the United Nations. Uh, are the ladies in politics in Australia? Do, the, do we ever hear from them there? Uh, oh, we hear from them right enough, yes. Uh, no, there aren't a great many in active politics. We've got three or four women, I suppose, in uh, active politics in Australia. But of course, behind the scenes, they take quite a hand in things. Mm. They're quite politically minded, but um, it doesn't result in many of them being actually members of our various parliaments. Would it be said there are places in the home in Australia, or would you say that? Uh, well, I'd probably be torn in half if <laughs> I would say that myself, <laughs> but you've said it. And Sandy, <laughs> Mr. Casey, we're uh, generally familiar here with your tennis players, and that brings us to a political point. In two years, I believe, the Olympics will be held in Australia, mm -hmm. and uh, the Soviet Union and Australia seem to have uh, taken back their ambassadors over the, uh, the case mm -hmm. of that chap, that Soviet uh, representative who chose freedom down there. Mm. Now, are you going to let the Russians in to play in the Olympic Games? Well, that really hasn't arisen yet, you know. I expect it will arise. 
Uh, I think it's a little problematical whether they'll come. Uh, the Russians broke off relations with us. They took the initiative and broke off relations by reason of the discovery of a, as you know, of a spy ring in Australia. Uh, and I think they'd probably have to uh, think a bit before they come out to Australia to take part in the Olympic Games. But I think if they were to um, apply for visas, I would expect that they'd get them. Mr. Casey, I'd like to ask you a very serious question, if we still have enough time. You confer, of course, with the highest authorities in the world on, on many subjects, particularly foreign policy. Do you feel that the Cold War is intensifying? Are we uh, hastening towards an inexorable conflict between the communist countries and the I free world? I don't necessarily think that at all. Of course, it is a, a, a matter, as you rightly say, of more of speculation than of judgment. But um, I can't bring myself to believe that the, war, the world is going to destroy itself uh, in another great war. The Cold War, of course, I think is going to go on. And I think that uh, the other side, the communist side, is much better at the Cold War than we are. They seem to be able to uh, devote more uh, imagination to uh, embarrassing us uh, by one uh, movement after another of the Cold War. As I say, I don't think we're anything like as well organized to conduct the Cold War as the, uh, as the communist countries are, unfortunately. But you don't think that a conflict is inevitable? If I had to answer yes or no to that, I would say no, I do not think a conflict is inevitable. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Casey. It's always a pleasure to welcome you here to the United States. Thank you very much, Mr. Stone. The opinions expressed on the Longines Chronoscope were those of the speakers. The editorial board for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope was Larry Lasseur and Francis W. Carpenter. Our distinguished guest was the Honorable Richard G. Casey, Foreign Minister of Australia. It's World Series time, the best time of the year for baseball fans. And this year again, as in years past, Longines times the series. Yes, all umpires for the World Series, as for all American and National League baseball games, use Longines watches exclusively for official timing. The most honored watch in the world of championship sport is Longines, the world's most honored watch. The only watch in history to win 10 World's Fair grand prizes, 28 gold medals, so many honors for accuracy in fields of precise timing. For in truth, Longines is not only one of the finest watches in all the world, but it's the watch of highest prestige. So when next you buy a watch, either for yourself or as an important gift, you will find Longines watches at your authorized Longines Whitnor jeweler in large array and priced as low as $71.50. The watch that times the World Series is Longines, the world's most honored watch the world's most honored gift, premier product of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company, since 1866, maker of watches of the highest character. This is Frank Knight reminding you that Longines and Whitnor watches are sold and serviced from coast to coast by more than 4,000 leading jewelers who proudly display this emblem Agency for Longines Whitnor Watches. At Longines Whitnor Jewelers, see Atmos, the perpetual motion clock created by Le Coultre. Atmos runs without winding, without electricity, powered only by variations in the temperature of the atmosphere. Atmos, product of Le Coultre, division of Longines Whitnor.